Welcome everyone to the last session of our summer workshop. This is going to be a special one as it is going to be a debate, a debate on the metaphysics of pregnancy. The question that we focus on is whether the body of the embryo or the fetus is a part of the mother's body. The two participants of the debate are Elsaline Kingma and Berit Brogar. Elsaline Kingma is a professor in philosophy and medicine at King's College London. She is a lead investigator on an ERC research grant investigating the metaphysics of pregnancy. Barry Brogard is professor of philosophy and runs a perception lab at the University of Miami in Coral Gables. She is the author of the books Transient Truths on Romantic Love and Hatred, among others. Before we start, I have to say a few words about the format. According to the plans, the session will be uh, one hour, 45 minutes long. We are going to start with presentations by the two speakers, then longer responses are going to follow. After that, we have maximally 25 minutes of open debate between the two, and then we are opening up the Q&A. So if that's correct, then Elseline Els may begin with her presentation. So uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I look forward to um, kind of exchanging ideas directly on this uh, with Briz. Um, so my uh, kickoff presentation is entitled Nine Months or Against the Container View. So let me point out what's at stake here, right? So uh, 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 Barry Smith and Rick Bro Brogard have argued that the foster or the fetus is not a part of the mother. And I argue that the foster or the fetus is a part of the maternal organism. Now, why is that relevant? For Smith and Brogard, although of course Brit may say different things, um, uh, after this, but in a published work, they argue that it's relevant for the question of when the organism, including the human organism, begins. I just find it an interesting question. I think what is important to point out is that what Britt and I agree on, at least in published work, is that there's no direct ethical implications from these kinds of views, right? These are exercises in metaphysics. Quite a lot of further work is going to be done if you want to say anything that is ethically relevant or politically relevant. So let me give you a bit of terminology, right? So I keep talking about the foster, which is something I've copied from um, Brogard and Smith's work. So the foster is the, the kind of pregnant material and it's meant to include anything from maybe the zygote and the blastocyst, but at least the embryo and the fetus throughout the pregnancy. And I also talk about the gravida and the gravida is the pregnant organism. And I put these pictures up here to remind you that, you know, although we'll mostly be talking about humans, the arguments, of course, are not particular to human mammals, but there are lots of other mammals in the world, and um, we should treat them similarly. Okay, so what do Smith and Roger say about organisms? Well, they say organisms are a topologically connected persisting physical object, right, or a substance in the Aristotelian sense. And with that, they place a lot of emphasis on boundaries. They say that the substance or the organism has a complete connected external boundary which separates it from other substances, or it has an external boundary that is established by a physical covering or membrane. And a lot of the argument will be about these boundaries, which is why I highlight them. So what is their argument, which I criticize? Well, they ask, when do human organisms begin? They have an argument that this happens not before gestation. These are familiar arguments about twinning, but that's not the focus for today. Because they also ask, well, if it's not before gastrulation, could it be after gastrulation? Oh, and gastrulation is the kind of early folding of the embryo around day uh, 12 to 14. So they ask, could it happen after gastrulation? And what they say is, well, they say, if the foster were part of the maternal organism or the gravida, then we have a problem, then it couldn't be an organism. But they argue, luckily, the foster isn't a part of the maternal organism. And so there isn't a problem here, right? The foster can be an organism from gastrulation onwards. And of course, my argument comes in at this point that I say, well, the foster is part of the maternal organism. And therefore, by Smith and Brogard's criteria, it can't be an organism until it ceases to be part of the gravida, until it ceases to be part of the maternal organism. And that's at the point of birth. So why do I argue, argue that? As I say, Smith and Brogard's criteria posit a requirement of complete external boundaries. So they write, there is no stage after ovulation where there's a strict topological connection between the foster 
and its mother. So that's what we have to assess, right? We have to examine whether or not there is a strict topological connection between the foster and the gravida. But to do that, we need to figure out what the extent or boundaries of the foster are. And this is something on the literature is I think often a bit vague. I'm not gonna settle it. I'm just gonna say, look, there's three options. Right? The first option is what I call the future baby view. So here we take the foster just to be that kind of sort of human, or in the case of guinea pigs, guinea pig, looking thing that, you know, kind of has the body shape of that it will have when it comes out. That's the future baby view. The second view is what I call the future baby with the placenta view, right? So here we have the kind of uh, baby shaped thing, but it includes the umbilical cord and the placenta. And the third possible view is what I call the chorionic content view, right? So here we have everything that derives from the early embryo. So this includes the amnion, the chorion, the amniotic fluid, the placenta, and there's some I think quite nice pictures of that here and it's looking quite different from the future baby. So any of these could be the kind of conception of the foster that you have when you try to determine whether there's a topological connection between the foster and the mother. So let's assess each one in turn, right? We start with the future baby view. So for the future baby view to uh, not be a part, right, for the future baby to not be a part of the maternal organism, there has to be no topological connection at the umbilicus or umbilical cord. Now that of course is true after you've cut off the umbilical cord, but prior to that and during all of pregnancy, surely the umbilical cord is a prime example of a topological connection, right? So Smith and Brogert write about the fetus that a connection is not even established in the form of a canal or tube through which blood or nutrients might flow. And of course, the umbilical cord is precisely a canal or tube through which blood or nutrients, and indeed essential blood and nutrients flow. Right? So the future baby view either isn't a good candidate for what Smith and Brogart has had in mind, and certainly doesn't give us a neat topological separation between the foster and the gravida. Now the other two views, right, the future baby with a placenta view, or the chorionic content view, both only give you a neat separation, topological separation with the maternal organism, if there is no topological connection at the placenta. But of course, and that's the crux of my argument, there are topological connections at the locus of the placenta, right? There is no neat separation of a maternal and fetal tissue or elements in a placenta. Can you see my cursor as I move it over the slide or not? Yes, we can. Okay, that's helpful. Right, so this is a cross section of the placenta. So, what we have here is we have fetal arteries surrounded by tissue that's all derived from the embryo. You know, we have these nice villi. This is all fetal tissue, right? And then we have fetal tissue here is maternal tissue, right? And around these fetal tissues, flow maternal blood. So what we have, right, and when the placenta separates off, it separates somewhere here in the maternal layer. So what we have in a placenta, right, is an organ that's co-constructed from fetal and maternal tissue, where there's simply no need separation, let alone an external boundary or a physical covering of a membrane that separates the fetus from the maternal organism. I have lots more pictures of the placenta that we can look at, right? But I'll try and keep it brief. So the key point here is that there is no strict topological separation between the foster and the maternal organism prior to birth, right? There is no boundary at the level of the umbilicus or the umbilical cord, and there is no boundary at the level of the placenta. So by Smith and Brogard's criteria in the 2003 publication, this means there is no complete external boundary, therefore no organism, and therefore mammalian organisms, including human organisms, can only begin at birth, which is when a topological separation is established. Now, where does that leave us in terms of recognizing, you know, the new human or new organism that evidently comes into existence at the point of reproduction at some point? Well, one option is to accept this conclusion, right? Which we'll call the beginning at birth view. 
humans, organisms, humans, organisms, mammalian organisms begin at birth and not before. A second, of course, option, of course, is to reject Smith and Brogard's account of the organism, you know, and look for a different one. And the third option would be to modify or adjust Smith and Brogard's account of the organism. So I'm guessing, but I don't know, that Brit might take one of these options. The other question is, well, what are the options for the maternal fetal relationship, right? Because of course, as part of this, I have argued that the foster is a part of the maternal organism. And there, I think that the part of view is actually motivated on grounds other than Smith and Brogard's account of the organism, right? So um, I have a paper in mind that goes through various accounts um, of the organism in biology. And I demonstrate that all of them give a good reason for recognizing the fetus as part of the maternal organism. So regardless of the details of Smith and Brogard's accounts, I think there are other arguments that make uh, what I call the parthood view, the plausible view. So I've put a list of references here. And with that, I think uh, I want to hand over to Britt. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a very nice talk. So next up is Brit. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for that presentation. Um, so I'm going to uh, skip a little bit ahead, uh, but I have some extra slides uh, that we can return to during uh, the open discussion. Um, but um, I'm going to skip um, ahead to, um, to, to uh, Kingma's view uh, and uh, see correctly outlines, I think, in, in, in my view anyway, uh, three options um, and the future baby view is clearly um, the option or some version thereof is what I would accept. Um, so in, um, in her argument, uh, or the, the sort of the, the crucial part of her argument is that there's no real boundary um, along the umbilical cord until after the body, baby is born uh, and the cord is cut. Um, and so on, so on that view, we, we would have um, a sort of an absurd view that if you wait cutting the cord, right, you would, um, you would have uh, a separation occurring, say you cut it two days after, you'd have a separation occurring two days after, if you cut it 50 minutes after the birth, you would have a separation occurring there, and so on. Um, so that sort of is sort of is the challenge uh, that I'm going to address here. Mm -hmm. Right. So here's the the argument. Um, so at least tentatively, um, I argue that there's a mistaken assumption um, in Kingman's argument, though not necessarily in her argument based on the 2003 paper. Um, but uh, on, on my view, I think that there is a reason to think about ontological dependence uh, in terms of defining um, in, in, in terms of defining substances, uh, and so a transient or contingent connection between mother and the foster or fetus. Uh, is not necessarily uh, a problem on, on that view. So I'm going to lay out what I mean by ontological independence. Um, oh, so you can see that something fell above, uh, below the line here, but let's say that Mona Lisa has lost a lot of blood and she receives donated blood from Carson Vinny through an air tube uh, placed in the vein of the arm and that she uh, would die without the connection to the supply of red blood cells. In that case, um, she still doesn't ontologically depend on any particular, right? She, she, she does that. We could, we could of course, uh, define ontological dependence in different ways, but regardless of how we define it, how, how we um, define the, the, the modal strength of that uh, ontological dependence, she doesn't depend on the blood cells from any individual, uh, like cousin Vinny. It's fine if cousin Freddie comes along and has the right blood type as well. Um, 
so basically, uh, so 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 uh, so even if we define ontological dependence not in terms of like uh, the metaphysical strength uh, that that you normally have when you talk about metaphysical dependence, if we if we weaken it, she still only depends on on in on on certain uh, a certain kinds of red, red blood cells. If you weaken the connections, to be sort of a, bi a biological dependence or something like that. Um, so, so substances in Aristotle's uh, sense, um, this of course is a re uh, a re reading or a reinterpretation of of Aristotle, but uh, there are reasons to think that um, substances, at least as a necessary condition, uh, require a form of ontological dependence. Again, uh, with emphasis on that it need not be metaphysical strength, of course but uh, perhaps uh, some kind of biological necessity that, that is involved here. Uh, but it's not ontological dependence on token parts, as in the case of Mona Lisa, but, uh, but rather on type parts. Uh, for example, blood or some other kind of liquid that can carry oxygen inside the body. Um, let's skip that. Uh, so, Likewise, I would say that um, being connected to the umbilical cord or the mother uh, is an essential um, with a weaker modal uh, strength here to the foster's survival. Uh, so the foster could in theory survive being severed from the cord and connected to a stranger uh, by an inter uh, intravenous tube and needle, for example. Uh, and this, of course, uh, biologically speaking, you know, though not in our actual technological states of development, uh, wouldn't destroy the, the, the foster or turn it into a different kind of being. Uh, so it does not ontologically depend in this um, weak biological sense on the umbilical cord of the mother. Um, so, th so this is uh, just to 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 um it's a reminder of of something you do mention perhaps in slightly different words in the 2003 paper but we do argue that uh, for a continuant or a substance to become a different kind of continuant or substance uh, we need something like a catastrophic change which we then argue doesn't happen at other stages, for example, it doesn't happen at the two cell stage, right? And so that's what we argue happens at, you know, around 16 days. Um, so an example, uh, another example of a catastrophic change is, uh, of course, the classical caterpillar to butterfly example, where uh, a caterpillar um, actually eats parts of parts of it it's itself in order to uh, transform into a butterfly and so it becomes a different entity in that case so that's a catastrophic change uh, and similarly well typically we don't have um, changes radical changes of species involving humans for example humans don't turn into to dogs or something like that but but our argument that would be that there's one kind of entity the caterpillar kind of entity before 16 days and the sort of butterfly afterwards um and and that that would contrast with um for example if you have two raindrops uh and you melt them together you just have another uh, raindrop you don't have a new um a new sort of Thing, a new species, if you will, um, or or another um, another sort of analogy um, that I use in in the, uh, the response to uh, to, to King Man that's uh, still unpublished. Um, I haven't haven't quite finished it. Uh, is that if you remove something from a container, um, then it doesn't necessarily right by just by being removed it's it, it doesn't undergo that kind of metamorphosis or or uh, catastrophic change 
Um, and then um, I, I just included this. Maybe maybe I'll actually just return to that in case there's a question about that because there was uh, some some uh, question um, in in um, Kingmas replied to us about about these uh, phrases, uh, but but the way that we used um, the term foster was sort of a, a, a term of art uh, to serve as a functional description that could sort of pick up whatever it is um, that um, that that is it say inside the womb of a, a woman um, and 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 is but is not the the born child right so so any time um, from from conception and until birth okay so I'll um, well maybe maybe I'll just say uh, just uh, two words about um, uh, about another criterion that we we haven't really discussed uh, in case you want to ask questions about it that we we don't or I don't hold um, substance uh, to be a substance or, or the status as a substance to be sufficient for something to be an organism. Um, I think that, uh, and I think that Barry would agree that I think that more is needed. And so, what happened here? Oh, there we go. Uh, more is needed, something like self-direction. Um, and self-direction, of course, uh, is difficult to define, um, but um, it definitely requires more than, say, being a virus. So uh, a virus might be an independent entity, right? In in, in depending on um, how you define the virus, because the virus can it can clearly um, it's not dependent on me specifically, right? In that sense, um, but it may be dependent on, so of course, a specific organism. But it also, which is important in this regard, it also isn't self-directed. So that's another way in which it's not really alive. Um, so a virus, um, sure, it can use your body to, to grow and metabolize and all that, but it isn't independently self-directed. So, um, so a further, at least one further condition on, on being an organism versus say a virus or say a mere substance. Uh, would be that it's also self-directed. Um, yeah, so that that uh, concludes my uh, little presentation. Great, thank you very much for this really clear introduction and answer to Elseline. So now Elseline has maximally 10 minutes, I would say, to respond. Yes, thank you. So um, we're beyond screen sharing uh, territory here because uh, neither, neither Britt nor I, I think, were um, organized enough to share advanced slide with each other. Uh, so I hope you'll, you'll be happy to, uh, um, to, to have me talk off the cuff. Um, so, uh, so that was very interesting, uh, uh, Britt, thank you. So a couple of things, right? So I was su surprised but interested to find that of the three views I suggest, the future baby view is the one that um, that you commit to or some version of which you commit to uh, because I would have thought that you know the plausible one would be one of the chorionic content or the baby of center really the chorionic content view so that's just just I just say that as a, that that's interesting right where you have a chance to to um, to interact directly um, so perhaps I'll just briefly say why I think that's the plausible view right so I think I mean, I don't think this is essential to the whole argument between us, but I think it's the plausible view because, you know, when you have the, the Morala, the Blastula, right, the very early embryo, I mean, it starts kind of growing all this stuff. And we probably all agree that all of that is directed towards eventually producing a new uh, organism. And that includes the placenta, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, the placenta isn't a part of the foster that will kick around forever. But you know, because it's it it it's an it's an it's a temporary organ that has a function until the point of birth, at which other organs will take over the previously weren't working properly, right? Like the kidney and the lungs and things like that. You know, I I see that much in the way that, say, a um, 
you know, a tadpole kind of turns into a frog, right? The tadpole has a tail and forgive me, I don't know enough details about amphibians, but presumably it's got ways of breathing underwater that maybe it loses later on when it becomes a frog and it grows, it grows legs. So I would have thought that the kind of plausible view is that the placenta is a part of the foster that it just, you know, loses us after birth, just as the and a stag might lose its antlers every season, or you know, pick one of those other examples. I mean, Britt asked me, or you, you mentioned the cord cutting. So um, uh, with a wonderful picture, you can rip this off the internet, right? Of lotus births now, where people keep the placenta attached, I think, until it falls off spontaneously. So I would have thought that, you know, the foster or fetus or new baby obviously undergoes a physiological transition after birth, right? Which is autonomous. I mean, if you don't cut and clamp the cord, then the fetus itself, you know, within minutes, but maybe maximum half an hour, will shut down that vasculature when it, you know, it changes its cardiovasculature, the heart becomes a double pump, it reverses its blood flow in the ductus arteriosus, right? You get all these cardiovascular changes as part of which it inflates the lungs, starts to breathe and shuts down the, um, the circulation in the umbilical cord and you know at that point the thing effectively st starts dying and then you know it will actually die and start to rot and fall off so i would have thought that that is kind of the point at which you know it'd be legitimate to say yeah there's still the, the skin connections but there's no longer right the tube through which the nutrients in the blood etc 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 flows you know whether or not we cut it at that point or, or, or later um, so yeah, that was just, um, so that's interesting that we differ on what the plausible view of the boundaries of the foster is. Um, but I think the real um, key interesting thing you talked about was, right, the issue of ontological dependence. So, I mean, I agree that kind of the real questions, of course, here are about continuance and face sortals, that the, the initially plausible view is that the foster is a face sort of human organism, right? We're a fetus and then a baby and then a child or adult. So, I mean, on the face of it, I'm not sure I disagree with that, right? But the question is kind of which option you take out of the three options you outline. So I'm pretty strongly wedded to the parted view, which as you said, um, which as I said, right, I've, dependent, I've defended in other places uh, on other grounds. But the part of the view only needs to stand in the way of the foster being a face sort of if we hold on to this view, right, that human organisms can't be part of other human organisms. And it strikes me that, you know, what the phenomenon of pregnancy kind of squarely delivers to us is the fact that human organisms can be part of other organisms. In, in fact, right, mammals need to start right? It's a kind of um, essential part of their existence that they start their lives as part of other organisms. So the way I would be inclined to go with this is to adjust if you're going to be in a kind of Aristotelian um, substance style view. And of course, what's interesting is that Aristotle, right? I mean, when he spoke about substances, like organisms are kind of the prime examples there, right? So we're really here in the core territory of what we want to be able to talk about. I would have thought that the the way you'd want to go is to recognize that organisms start as parts of other organisms of the same kind. And of course, on the kind of a substance view as it now exists that spells these, um, these problems, because they, um, certainly your formulation, Brit, with, with Barry, but others as well, kind of prevent entities from uh, being a continuance, right? Staying the same whilst going from being a part of one thing um, to being something independent. And it strikes me that that is just an implausible view on the face of it as well, right? So if I donate, if I have a kidney, um, which I would like to donate to say, Brit, who needs it, right? Then we, that kidney's a part of me, we'll take it out, it will cease to be a part of me, and then we give it to Brit. I would think that that remains the same kidney that has made its way from being a part of me to now being a part of Brit. So that suggests to me that a plausible picture on the world would have to recognize any way that we can you know, move parts around 
in a way that allows them to remain the same kind of thing. And then what you can set up, which I think you would have to set up, is a metaphysics where we recognize that all mammals start as parts of other mammals, um, but become eventually an independent mammal. So that you have the parthood view and uh, the continuant view. Um, I mean, I would like to say something more about the blood donation, but I think I'm pretty much at the end of my um, of my ten minutes. So I'll just stop there, and presumably we'll come back to some of this other stuff. Um, All right, thanks. So <laughs> the word is yours. Floor is yours. Uh, right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I just want to um, say uh, just a little bit about the future baby view and then uh, something about ontological dependence in response to chemo's response and um, we of course would I should say I because I haven't actually uh, run any of this by, by Barry um, so I I would not uh, accept the future baby view of course as stated so just a reminder uh, to to um, to the rest of you um, uh, on Kingman's view, the the future baby view um, is the view that uh, the foster, right, the embryo fetus, blah blah blah, coincides with that part of, of the pregnancy pregnancy material that will emerge as a future baby about nine months later, right? So um, so it will emerge in that sense, right? Nine months later. Uh, when the baby is born and separate it from the pregnancy uh, material, just on that view. I'm not saying it's her view. I'm just saying this is one that she calls the future baby view. I mean, of course, if you formulate it that way, then it's not at all uh, the view that I'm defending here, but it is the closest of the three to the view that I want to defend because I still want to say that when it's connected, when the, the, the fetus or the embryo is connected to the mother um, after 16 days, uh, roughly 16 days, it's, um, it's, it's still um, clearly connected and it needs nutrients from the mother and so on. But what I wanted to say is that it merely sort of coincides, right, uh, with was a part of the pregnancy material that has, um, or or it, it 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 has a different status as being embedded in that uh, full portion that would include the placenta, the um, maybe part of the the the, the, the uterus, right, um, uh, presumably, and the umbilical cord. There we have sort of. Um, a sum of parts that would include the the, the embryo or fetus, right? Um, and I would say that that um, in that case, if you if you think of the of the uh, typical or often discussed view in in metaphysics of a of a, of clay, a lump of clay and a statue, right? Um, you have, um, on one view anyway, you, uh, you could say that, that the clay, the lump of clay coincides with the statue, when, when it's shaped like a statue. Um, but you could destroy the statue without um, destroying the lump of clay. So if you cross the statue, uh, the lump of clay is still there but now it's no longer a statue. Uh, I'm not saying that this is exactly the same because clearly in the case of pregnancy, you have more than just um, the fetus or the embryo uh, involved there. You have uh, the umbilical cord, the placenta, part of the uh, uterine lining and so on. Um, but that that's uh, sort of just to clarify that uh, if we did accept the future baby view, that would be, of course, a rejection, a complete rejection of the 16 days. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a version. It's a, it's a coinciding 
part that I'm emphasizing in saying that it's a version of the future baby view. Um, so I wanted to say just a bit about the ontological dependence. So in the 2003 paper, um, I, uh, I don't recall anymore which kind of, what kind of terminology we used in that paper. Uh, Barry has throughout the, the years used terminology like substance, continuance, um, but, but, but inspired by, by Aristotle all along. Um, he does not talk about ontological dependence as far as I know. We certainly don't do it in the 2003 paper. Um, but in order to uh, characterize, fully characterize what a substance is, uh, and there, even though Aristotle, of course, often used organisms as great examples or paradigmatic examples of substances, um, it's it's not the only kind of, of substance uh, that he would recognize as being a substance, right? That, that, that seems clear from his, his writings that uh, you could have uh, non organisms that are also substances. But then what is a substance uh, on the Aristotelian view, which clearly, I mean, that, that, that was what we relied on because we relied on, on Barry's uh, idea of, the, of a continuant in, in, in the 2003 paper. But now I'm trying to take it a bit further by, by um, invoking the notion of ontological dependence. But ontological dependence, um, of course, needs to have a certain strength because if one thing depends on another, just as if you have one thing supervening on another, uh, you you can vary the the strength. Um, but so often, if you talk about uh, dependence or supervenience, or even uh, the more uh, recent term like grounding uh, in, in metaphysics, we're talking about the almost most the maximally strongest uh, modality, right? Or, or maybe almost the strongest like metaphysical dependence or uh, metaphysical supervenience. But, um, but if we, if, if, if in the ethics literature, for example, um, supervenience and dependence, for example, is often restricted uh, much more than um, it is in metaphysical literature. And so what I had in mind is not um, some kind of logical or metaphysical dependence, uh, but some kind of dependence uh, that is still a modal dependence, right? So even biological dependence um, is not, goes beyond what, what actually is the case. Um, so I so 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 that that was one part I just wanted to reemphasize in response to King Ma. Uh, and, and another uh, way that um, I use ontological dependence uh, in order to characterize substances in Aristotle's sense is that I don't use it. Uh, I don't think it's obvious. I think to anyone that substances in his in Aristotle's sense could not be. Uh, it were involved ontological dependence on on their token parts, right? So, mirological sums, for example, if we talk about holes and parts, parts and holes, mirological sums as, as well as sets of members, right? Um, they uh, they they depend in the strongest modal sense on their token parts, right? In fact, the mirological sum is constituted of its token parts, metaphysically constituted of its token parts. But what I was, uh, what I was suggesting was that substances in Aristotle's sense, at least as a necessary criterion, would um, depend in a weaker sense on, on type parts. Um, so, so the mirological, uh, the, so, so it wouldn't, the I mean, mirological view would not uh, capture substances in an Aristotelian sense. Um, and I, I don't think that, that Kima um, disagree with that because clearly mirological sums, unless you have some specialized version of those, uh, 
they 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 can't survive uh, a loss, right? A change or a loss of a a part, right? A set cannot survive a loss of a member, right? So, so substances have to be something that that can survive changes um, of parts um, and radical transformations. Substances can survive uh, quite radical changes, but of course, something needs to be said about when they are no longer substances. All right, thanks. So, uh, Asseline has suggested that uh, we should uh, return to the example of the blood transfusion. And I wanted to ask a clarificatory question with regard to that. And now we are actually in what in the in the in what I've called an open debate between you two. It should run for like uh, 25 minutes or so, maximally, I would say. So my clarificatory question is the following: uh, Could you, Barrett, please uh, tell us an example where a sub substance or an organism depends on the token? and not, not only the type of another substance. Maybe you have uh, already told us one, I, and I will just... Uh, yeah, yeah, so so uh, I'm not sure I can come up with a good um, alternative to what I, I said, but let me repeat what I said. So, mm -hmm. a biological sum um, uh, or, or uh, a set in the mathematical sense uh, depends Right, ontologically, um, in fact, in, in in a very strong metaphysical sense, uh, on on its its parts. Um, so, if you remove a part from, um, if you if we consider you a mirological sum, mm -hmm. if we were to consider you a mirological sum, um, and we remove we scrap your uh, your face or we shave you or something like that, and then. Uh, um, you you are no longer the the same entity. If we consider, if we were to consider you a mirological sum, or if you have a set of uh, of three numbers, so you have a set of the number one and the number two and the number three. Uh, now it's mathematical, so we can't really remove stuff. But if we sort of imagine that we could remove a number, we have a different set, right? To remove the number three, we have a new set that consists of one and two. So, um, so they so 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 that's been a problem um, for those who wanted to use the mirological view to account for a continuance, including myself. Um, when I started out uh, in, in graduate school, I wanted to to change uh, mirolo um, you know principles, mirological principles to capture change, but but that's uh, that's quite difficult to do. Uh, because it's it's uh, it it really functions as as a a concrete uh, or or it functions as as a kind of set theory, right? Mirology was was invented as a kind of set theory that could avoid uh, that could avoid universals, right? Because you because sets are universals, right? So so if you're nominalist, like like uh, when mirology would Lesniewski was came up with mirology uh, because he was a nominalist. He needed some some alternative to sets. So so uh, so sort of off the top of my head, that would be sort of the the paradigm example. Of course, it becomes a much uh, trickier when we weaken the dependence relation, right? So so when I'm talking about something constituting something else. In terms of a mirological uh, sum being constituted by its parts, I'm talking about metaphysical, a metaphysical, so logical or metaphysical um, um, modal strength. But I'm assuming, though I, I haven't really finished this paper, but I'm a, um, I, I can't imagine that um, <clears throat> a substance would require something as strong as that. Um, Elseline, would you like to reply? To uh, that? Yeah, so, I mean, part of the key issue, right? I mean, there's some two key issues that we need to hone in on here. One is what exactly ontological dependence 
I mean, what it is, what role it's going to play in marking out substances. And then the, that's on the theoretical side. And then on the pragmatic side, right, there is the kind of um, the comparison with something like blood transfusion, right? So, I mean, I, you know, I'm in agreement that like blood transfusion can't be ontological dependence, just as much as, you know, the, the views that we don't ontologically, I mean, we might ontologically depend on being oxygen available, but that's not strong enough for us to ontologically depend on oxygen. So the key question, if you go down that route, right, is whether the fetus and the way it's hooked up with an eternal organism is going to be a strong enough case of dependence to mark it out as a part. So, I mean, I'm also still thinking about this and I haven't quite worked it out. Um, in part because, you know, I just find some of these notions quite slippery and I think we're kind of marred in some ways by the ways that we are taught to think about fetuses, right? So we think, we're taught to think of them as far more independent <laughs> than they actually are, right? We're constantly fed images and talk of fetuses as a kind of detached entity in space. And so we almost forget that, you know, these entities only exist within pregnancy in the context of a pregnancy. So, I mean, so we've spoken about the way that substances, right, depend on their parts. But if I'm not mistaken, you know, Aristotle, or at least some interpretation on it, also have the view that parts ontologically depend on the whole, right? So, um, so the example is something like, you know, I have a nose, you know, that's part of me, and the nose is only a nose because it is a part of me, right? So for being a kind of thing it is, and the nose isn't a substance, right? It's a part, it's a thought. But for being a kind of thing it is, for being a nose, or a heart or an arm, right? It's gotta be part of an organism. Now, of course I could cut off my nose, but the thought is what I would then be left with is not really a nose anymore, but it's a lump of flesh, right? So the thought is that parts of entities ontologically depend on a whole because only as part of the whole are they what they are. So that's what I, um, why I mentioned this example of the kidney, right? Because the kidney, Kind of puts pressure on that right? because um like the cat i mean not just plausibly we can in fact i mean given take certain kind of histocompatibility issues we can take out my kidney keep it you know sufficiently okay for a while and give it to brit and then it will function as a part of her so one question for that view generous well, what because you know i think we might be distorted if we just think about it, right, as a part that ontologically depends on the whole, but that nonetheless, we can transfer from one to the other. So then going back to the fetus, right, we kind of have to ask this question about the fetus. That's the best way I think I can try and think my head around it. And it strikes me that, I mean, set, set aside for a moment the later parts of pregnancy, right, for much of the pregnancy, you know, a fetus, I mean, it is what it is, only as part of a functioning pregnancy, right? Sure, we could cut it out. We do that all the time. That's the termination, right? What we are then left with is, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I mean, I'll call the, the, the nose a lump of flesh. I'll, I'll call the abortion also a lump of flesh. Of course, people will have, you know, might, might, might want to pick some different terms for talking about it, right? But the key point remains that mm -hmm. We, 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 um, we only have whatever it is, let's say it's an organism, an organism as this physiologically hooked up part of a functioning pregnancy, for it to be a fetus. So that gives me, so that's one way, I think, trying to get a hook on this ontological dependence on at least the parted view, right? This is the strength of the parted view. Now, of course, that raises some questions about later on the pregnancy, because, you know, pregnancy reached a point where you know, with great difficulty, we can we can take out the fetus and keep it alive. I mean, that's kind of gets us into the kidney territory. But of course, a bit further on later on in the pregnancy, I mean, it can just come out and survive. Although, of course, it still has to come out in quite a particularly physiologically organized way, right? That's a that's a kind of managed biological transition. It's not just a case of cutting off. Um, so that I think is one way to get a handle using these notions of ontological dependence on whether the fetus is a part 
of the maternal organism. And so I think that actually speaks in favor of that view. But then there's also the issue of the continuance, right? So if we have these parts, can they be continuance? And like I said before, right, I think what we have to change in these kind of views is we have to think that maybe parts can continue as non-parts or parts, even though they're ontologically dependent on the whole, can be taken out and continue as the same part with the kidney example. So that's where I would kind of think you need to tweak um, some of these kinds of views. But of course, I've been talking about ontological dependence of the parts depending on the whole. Brits has been talking about ontological dependence of the holes on the parts. I mean, I completely agree with Brett that, uh, you know, about the point that, um, you know, we ontologically depend on types of parts, but not token parts. As again, kidneys examples are illustrated. Yeah, so Britt, would you like to tweak these points a little bit? Just briefly, um, so, right, so, um, so the line here, so we've got to set, set aside exactly what, what Aristotle meant, uh, and let's just say a continuance, right, um, or a substance in a new Aristotelian sense. Um, that That's sort of the question that, Kingma uh, raises, uh, at least indirectly, or directly. Um, so while I'll go with that, I read a paper, uh, in, but but that's what she raises. What 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 sort of um, is is the 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 fetus? Is that a a continuant or or a substance of sorts? And and so the 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 sort of the line that I was going to take or in the paper the part the draft of the paper uh, reply I have um, is that um, if the, the the fetus is ontologically independent in this alternative sense uh, that she just uh, outlined of the mother right. And, and the mother, you know, other other things like the the cord. If it's an ontologically independent before the the umbilical cord is cut, um, then we can sort of maintain the view that um, a catastrophic change or a metamorphosis takes place around sixteen days. So, of course, the tricky question is uh, what we what is that kind of ontological dependence and it's not ontological dependence in the sense of depending on a token but or token parts but rather type parts but also we would have to weaken uh the modality here right because um you can um if you, if, if you have something like ontological uh independence um at the metaphysical level we're talking about um, things that are biologically impossible. So I'm, ass I'm assuming I haven't fully worked that out, but I'm assuming that um, I would want to to limit or weaken the ontological dependence to involve biological modality rather than full blown metaphysical modality. In other words, we're talking about um, modality that keeps uh, the biological laws constant as opposed to uh, the standard metaphysical dependence where we keep metaphysical laws constant. And so if, if I can argue that the fetus is ontologically independent of the mother and the cord and so on, um, then we could maintain that that, that is uh, that kind of catastrophic chains uh, roughly around 16 days um, even though there's a contingent, of course, a contingent connection for nutrition and so on, waste products, uh, all the way through, right? In fact, if you keep, um, or if you take the, the if after the child is born, right, uh, there's the, the, the umbilical cord still transfers nutrients or some, some nutrients presumably are still transferred uh, for a while, 15 minutes or something. Um, oxygen and so on uh, between the mother and the fetus, but I would call that um, conti a contingent connection rather than the stronger uh, biologically necessary um, connection 
So if I could argue for that kind of ontological independence between the, um, the fetus and the mother, then, um, then I don't have to accept the conclusion that it's not until we cut the, the cord that, uh, that a, a human animal or human organism comes into existence. Can I ask a question? Just so, so, Brett, would you be would you be happy then to combine such a view with, um, you know, would you be happy to think that that is compatible with with a parthood view? It's compatible uh, with a, you said parthood. Was that what you said? Yeah. yeah, compatible with the thought that the fetus is part of the maternal organism. Yeah, it's part. It, uh, yes, I. I um, I'll be happy with that uh, because so as long as by part we are not defining them in strict neurological terms, right? Because because they they're like sets, right? So so they can't survive any changes. Uh, so, right, no, 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 but we wouldn't because we're talking biology yeah. anyway, right? I mean, right, 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 exactly. So so the nails are part of me. Of, they of, 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 yeah, uh, I know that <laughs> that that that's what you mean, but it's to clarify. Yeah, no, it's yeah, I'll be happy with. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to say it's a part of. Um, right. So I I agree with that. Um, but I but I could yeah I um I think uh, we'll see when I finish the paper. But uh, I think I can could still maintain the the key line that um, that a new organism or new new animal, if you wish, comes into existence or a new continuant. Uh, a new kind comes into existence around 16 days. But of course, uh, we haven't talked about all the ethical uh, implications, and it may well be that in the end that we uh, uh, we agree about the ethical uh, implications. And of course, uh, part of this discussion does not involve uh, questions about personhood either. So, um, so, so ethical the ethical implications would be interesting to discuss as well. But but that. It may turn out that we agree on those. It's going to turn out not to be too too much of a debate in the end. Because <laughs> 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 of course, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I mean, I don't think I'm wedded to the. I'm very keen on the parted view. You know, that I think the beginning at birth view comes out when I think we combine that with you know the original criteria you had in the year two thousand and three. But you know, I think the most plausible thing is to think, well, you know, we need to adjust that because, um, yeah, it is. Flip flop, your face sort of the same yeah. continuance. I, mean, I think that is, you I know, think, I think that that that's probably high, very high cost to accept that that's not true. I mean, that's what we yeah. all. I think that about. that that we also have uh, a greater agreement than uh, many other people who have responded to our view who have argued that uh, a human organism comes into existence, say at conception, yeah. for example, or, or some, at some earlier stage. Uh, that, that was sort of the view that we were um, to had it, in mind yeah. that we were arguing against. In fact, I wrote a, an independent paper, um, which was um, to, to defend uh, uh, the use of, for example, uh, taking out uh, fertilized fertilized eggs or, or young embryos, right, and implanting them and so on. Um, so so as, as the kind of things that you do pre-embryo, I, I guess it would be uh, prior to 16 days. And so all, you, all I needed for that would be to, to push, push the dates from conception to 16 days in order to make the points about, about that. Um, but uh, but yeah, in terms of ethical um, implications, that might be um, it. Might be that that um, we have maybe slightly different, or we do have slightly different metaphysical approaches, but we might agree on the ethical implications. Although that would be a different debate. <laughs>